Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Paul Turner, Elena's brother. The Said Turner family and I thank you all so much for coming. I know this isn't uh, the best time, easiest time to travel uh, or a good time for attending gatherings, but I suspect all of us who were lucky enough to know and love Abdul Aziz Said, his family, his friends, his colleagues, his students, wouldn't miss an opportunity to celebrate a life that touched ours in such a meaningful way. Aziz's many years on this earth were the definition of a life well lived. He moved easily among scholars and shepherds, princes and paupers, presidents and political prisoners. Aziz had an impact on all within his sphere, including you and me. My sister recently asked me to describe Aziz in just five words. For those of you who know me, uh, I, you could easily imagine that I would ponder and analyze this request for weeks. <laughs> However, the thought of a dozen daily reminders from my sister spurred me to immediate action. I immediately blurted out the first five words that came to mind. Wise, compassionate, engaging, curious, loving. Even after some time to reflect and analyze, it was clear I wouldn't change a word. Aziz was clearly and obviously all these things and more. Today's celebration will offer perspective on, on Aziz from some people who knew him the best. What it was like to be his son, his colleague, his student, his brother at different stages of the extraordinary journey that was his life. Aziz led a long, full life and left the world a better place than he found it. While we miss him terribly, there is so much for us to celebrate. Before we begin, there's a slight change to the program. The first two main speakers will be appearing uh, by pre-taped video. Also, I have some quick housekeeping things for everyone. Please make sure that your cell phones are turned off and in the upright position. <laughs> Please keep your masks on, with some exceptions, during uh, this remembrance. But also note that you don't need masks uh, when we at the reception outside later on. Hand sanitizer and extra masks are available uh, on the table just outside the ballroom doors if you need them. Bathrooms are located over there. So you kind of swing around like that to get to them. And if you have any questions, um, Angela, where's Angela? OK, if you have any questions, please uh, see the events planner par excellence. That's Angela McLean. Uh, if you have any, any kind of questions or concerns, you can ask her. Uh, and with that, I would, I would now like to introduce Aziz's granddaughter, Ariana Saeed. Um, I'll be reading a poem, a prayer written by my grandfather called Prayer of Remembrance. Let us remember the children, women, and men everywhere who live with injustice and disease as their constant companions. Let us connect with our sisters and brothers who spend their lives establishing equal protection of the law and equal opportunity for all. Let us celebrate all the people who have spent their lives helping make the world a community of justice and peace. Let us do what we can that all creatures may enjoy a fair portion of the riches of our planet Earth. Let us honor our humanity and ourselves. Abdulaziz Saeed. Thank you. Um, my name is Mia. I'm Amu Aziz and Auntie Elena's niece. I'm going to be reading my Amu Aziz's favorite verse written by the renowned Arab Andalusian, Sufi poet and philosopher Ibn Arabi. This verse is from his longer poem, The Interpreter of Desires. My heart has become capable of accepting every form, a pastor for gazelles and a monastery for Christian monks, a temple for idols and a pilgrim's cabal, tablets for the Torah and the book of the Quran. I follow the religion of love wherever its mountains lead. This is my religion and my faith. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Hector Alcalde, and I would like to thank Elena for including me in this important event, honoring the life of a wonderful man, a man that we all love. I met Abdul in 19... 
64 at a reception at the home of the political council of the Spanish embassy, Luis Moreno. Luis was a mutual friend. And uh, he, Abdul, and I would get together occasionally for lunch and to visit, talk about world events, current events, and the things that we talk about today when uh, we get together informally. At the time I met Abdul, I had just lost a brother who was 43 years old, a writer, an actor, a father of three, who was a very important person in my life. Abdul reminded me of him in so many ways. And I related, related to Abdul, that relationship I had. And before too long, he and I were referring to each other as brothers. Abdul personified him to me in so many ways and reminded me of what he meant to me. I was thinking of words that I would use to describe Abdul today, but I realized that he was one of a kind. No one word or group of words could do justice in defining him. I saw in him a compassion, a love for all people, and, a, and an understanding of those less fortunate in life, whoever they were or where they ever came, or wherever they came from. We often spoke of education as being the great equalizer that helps so much by informing people's vision of the world and what it is today. His life was about education and sharing knowledge with thousands of people whose lives that he touched. In the mid-60s, the Vietnam War was capturing the headlines. And those of you who, who go back long enough and knew him then would remember how strongly he felt about that war and what was happening in our country. I shared those views. And uh, we frequently talked about that. President Johnson, just about the time he was committing more of our men and women to that war, also launched the war on poverty. I was chief of staff at that point in time to, to a member of the Education and Labor Committee and was very much involved in developing many of the acts that were being presented to, to the Congress and much of the legislation that became law. The Higher Education Amendments Act, Elementary Secondary Education Act, but was mostly involved in the Economic Opportunity Act, which included Head Start. The 88th Congress was referred to as the Education Congress by virtue of the fact that they committed more money to education than all the preceding 87 Congresses combined. As we worked on that, and the, the small amount of, of input that I had, I had my brother and my mentor, Abdul, providing ideas, counseling me, and counseling others. His role and leadership at his university when they were developing the uh, conflict resolution and analysis program, paralleled my time as rector and board member of George Mason University, where we were doing the same thing. Those involved in developing those programs all were aware of Abdul's involvement in these type of issues and respected his input he made a great contribution, not only to the program at his university, but the other programs that would mushroom later at other universities. I can go on for hours uh, talking about Abdul and the many experiences we had. He was my mentor and, as I said, my best friend. 
I would like to share with you one anecdote in which I asked him about making gifts and the idea of giving during certain times of year. And he would say, Hector, give, make gifts because it makes you feel good, not because you're expecting anything in return. Oftentimes, people give because they expect something in return. But when you give, give because you want to and because it makes you feel good. That, in many ways, personified him. That was vintage Abdul, and I have never forgotten that. In closing, I'd like to say I, I was one, as a young teacher, I was once asked by a student, what happens to all of that knowledge that has been accumulated in the course of a lifetime by these great scholars? And to me, Abdul was one of the great scholars. What happens when they pass away and they're no longer with us? The answer to that question is, and will always be, is that they leave it with us. And Abdul has left all that learning, all that scholarship, all those thoughts and ideas in his writings and his memoirs to all of us. And it's incumbent upon us to share it with others, to pass it on. One thing we all know, life will ultimately end, but love is endless, and we will forever remember Abdul, and he will forever live in our hearts. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here with you today. Good afternoon. I'm Hani Farsi. I'm very sorry that I can't be with you in person today. Elena and Riyadh, I send you both all my love and warm wishes. The only thing that would have kept me away from you today would be something like a government mandated ban on travel from the EU and the UK to the US. I hope to be with you all very soon, inshallah. It's fitting that I now stand in front of portraits of my late father, Muhammad Said Farsi, as I speak about dear Professor Abdulaziz Said, because the professor was in many ways a second father figure to me. I've had two great mentors in my life. One was my father, and the other was Professor Said. I first met Professor Said on August 2nd, 1990. And the reason I remember that date so clearly is because I woke up that morning to the news that Iraqi tanks had rolled into Kuwait, and the invasion of Kuwait had begun. It was a momentous day, and one that would change my life in many ways. I was at a point in my life um, that Many people find themselves in, in their early 20s. Unsure of what direction to take, I didn't know who I was, and at the same time, the university was equally uncertain about me. So, in trying to decide what best to do, a mutual friend of my family and the professor suggested that I speak with him. I had, of course, heard of an Arabic professor at AU. I had seen the professor around campus. You couldn't miss him, but I'd never met the man before. So I walked into Professor Said's office on time on the 2nd of August, and he greeted me with what I later discovered was his usual salutation. Hello, hello, he said to me as he stood up and shook my hands. My eyes wandered around the office. I'd never seen any office like this before. There was incense, frankincense burning in one corner, books from all over the world, photographs, and I remember a, an ancient reproduction of an, uh, sorry, a, a reproduction of an ancient Arabic map uh, of the known world hanging. As my eyes turned back to him, I noticed him sitting down and staring at me. His eyes were intense, full of intensity, but also full of kindness. And of course, I noticed his eyebrows. You couldn't miss those. As intimidating as that first impression might seem, the professor made me feel at ease, more so than any other teacher that I ever come across. He spoke to me in a different way. It wasn't accusatory, it wasn't condescending, it wasn't challenging, genuinely curious. He asked me questions that I had never considered, and when 45 minutes had gone by, he'd asked me to return at the same time next day, but this time to bring my father. My father happened to be in this year at that time visiting me. So, next day, 
My father went in, sat down with the professor, and I was asked to, to return when they called for me. So I was called to come back and see them an hour or so later. I was told that they had reached an agreement. And the agreement was that the professor was to take me on. Those were the words. He'll be working with him for a year, and at the same time, I'll ask the university to give me a leave of absence for that period. I was uh, somewhat scared and intrigued, but I was told the professor was going to set the program for me. Over the course of that period, over a year, the professor had given me, gotten me an internship with Amnesty International. But outside of that, I spent most of my free time with him. I would accompany him to his lectures outside of school and speeches. I would drive him around, have his papers. I would discuss my progress with him. Uh, he would give me a list of readings. He would discuss my personal life. I had lunch with him. I also meditated with him in his khilwa, which is his meditation room downstairs. And at that time, I had the pleasure of meeting Elena and Riyad. Professor Saeed made me feel like family. And I fondly remember having Thanksgiving dinner with all of them at his house. The professor introduced me to meditation and to the writings of Jalal al-Din Rumi and Sufism. He made me feel and become more aware of my duty to help those who are less privileged than me. The professor helped me see the world in a different way. It was no longer a question of getting a degree and getting a job to fulfill your role in society. It was now a question of ensuring that I was on a path that would allow me to live a life of meaning. Almost without me knowing it, the professor was slowly rebuilding me. I was doing work that I thought was worthwhile. I was interested in the world and what others had to say, and I became a lot more engaged. When I returned to school a year later, I switched to SIS and enrolled in the Peace and Conflict Resolution under Professor Said's tutelage. For the, first of my, for the first time in my life, I enjoyed all my lectures and my time at the university. And throughout my years as a professor, I saw how much the students genuinely loved him and how engaged he was with all of them. I don't remember him ever raising his voice. His classes were always full with virtually no dropouts at all. I wouldn't be surprised if the professor knew the names of almost all of his students throughout the years, and he's taught for more than 55 years. The professor treated everybody and spoke to everybody with equal dignity and kindness. The parking valet would be greeted in the same way that my father would be greeted, and this was not an act. This was who the man was. I learned as much from observing the professor as I did from all the books he had given me. On the eve of my graduation, I was driving the professor from his house to the university. I remember him turning to me and saying the following words, please, don't be another rich, fat Arab. I know that you can make a difference. Then he smiled at me. Those words have never left me. I have tried to honor them and live by them. And in 1996, when my father and I set up AU's chair for Islamic peace, it was only right that the professor would be its first occupant. The professor and I continued our friendship over the years. He would visit me in London frequently, and I would never pass through DC without visiting him and Elena. We would always have two get-togethers. One with the family, with Elena, with friends, and the other would be one-on-one. -on -one. We always wanted to make sure that I was okay. Before I met the professor, I only saw obstacles. And after his mentorship, I only saw possibilities. He helped me see a path when I initially saw none, and inspired me to pursue it. It's safe to say that I'll be nowhere, I'll be nowhere near where I am today if I had not met the professor on the 2nd of August, 1990. And no man besides my father can be said to have influenced my life and my path as significantly as Professor Saeed has. As a friend and also as a mentor, I was very lucky to have met him when I did. And I think about him every day and I miss him dearly. I'd like to leave you in the same way that he has signed up all his letters and emails. Peace be with you. Good afternoon. My name is Keith Rosenberg. Professor was my mentor and my lifelong friend. If he were here today, he would say that the greatest contribution that I made to our friendship was that I introduced him to Alina. <laughs> but that is a story for another day. 
My journey with Professor began in the summer of 1964. I was going into my senior year in high school and strolling through the Rutgers University bookstore when I came upon Concepts of International Politics by Lurch and Saeed. My eyes were drawn to it. I picked it up, scanned it, bought it, took it home and read it. I was so intrigued by concepts that I decided that I wanted to attend the School of International Service and meet Professor Saeed. So I called him on the phone, you know, the thing that had a wire on it. <laughs> and he, he spoke to me and he said, come and visit me, we'll talk. So it was November 11th, 1964, because in those days you got Veterans Day off. I don't think you do that anymore. And I went to his office to speak to him briefly before class. And then I sat in on his class, and we, after class, he invited me back to his office, and we spoke for about an hour. And there was that immediate connection. It's the connection that everybody in this room understands but can't define. And after the conversation, he goes, you know, he always said this, yes, yes, yes. He said, if you want to come here, you send me your application. And if you do well, maybe you can come and work for me. So I held up my end of the bargain, and he held up his. And it was the beginning of a relationship that lasted the rest of our lives. I was an undergraduate assistant, a graduate assistant, and a teaching fellow. And although he taught me many, many things, because we don't have hours for that, there were three things that have always stuck with me for my life. Number one, never speculate on a person's motives. Judge people by what they do and what they say. Number two, be a critical thinker. Always question the source of what you read and what you hear and what you see. And finally, always be true to yourself and what you believe in. Professor was not only my mentor and my best friend for a long time, he was also my fraternity brother. He was responsible for the creation of Phi Epsilon Pi fraternity at American University, the first Jewish fraternity on campus. And the story of its creation speaks to the character of this man. Excuse me for a second. <laughs> now imagine a young, untendered, untenured professor of Syrian descent comes to the aid of a bunch of Jewish kids who want to form their own fraternity because these existing fraternities would not let them join. There was an exclusionary clause. Blacks and Jews need not apply. He believed that fraternities should be required to remove the exclusionary clauses and allow Jews and blacks admission. But he was bumping up his head up against the administration. So at first, he said to the administration, look, why don't you have the exclusionary clauses removed? Of course, they politely said no. But he had plan B. If you won't remove the exclusionary clauses, let these boys form their own fraternity. And that was an offer they could not refuse. And thus was formed the Beta Beta chapter of the Phi Epsilon Phi fraternity at AU. And Phi Ep lived up to the professor's expectations. And his principles, we invited young men of all races, creeds, religions to be members of a Jewish fraternity. <laughs> and throughout the fraternity's existence, Professor was the only faculty advisor we ever had. In 2004, Professor was recognized for his dedication to Phi Ep, receiving the Phi Epsilon Pi National Jewish Fraternity Living Legend Award. As his health began to fail, the brothers gathered one time and recorded via Zoom our memories to thank him for all that he had done for us. You know, the older we become, this is very hard for me, the more we acknowledge that we will lose the people that we love so dearly. But it's always still difficult to lose somebody that you really love. I love Professor, and he loved me. I know in time, the wonderful memories of his teaching and our friendship will overshadow the loss of his passing. As my wife will tell you, she's here today, in our bedroom is a picture. It's a photograph of Professor with his arm around me, and he's smiling. 
and I look at it every night, and I smile back. Hello, everyone. My name is Shahrazad Jafari, and I was Professor Syed's last PhD student before he retired. There is so much I could say about my experience as Professor Syed's student. I could talk about the long list of things, long list of ways that he supported me, that any PhD student would be so grateful to have in their relationship with their PhD chair, opportunities to co-publish together, the mentorship he provided throughout my dissertation process, people he introduced me to who funded my research and offered job opportunities. This list is long and I will be forever grateful for the ways he shaped my professional trajectory. But what I'd really like to talk about is how he impacted me at the heart level. What I learned from just being around him, from witnessing how he treated others and how he did what he did. By far the best education I ever received was through the opportunity to sit beside him in class for four years as his teaching assistant to witness firsthand how he taught and how he treated his students. He'd always say on the first day of class that in this class, learning is not going to come from just a one-way path of knowledge or even a two-way path, but from multiple paths. We're all here to learn from each other. He would say that he's not doing his job as a professor if he is not also learning from his students. And sure enough, after over five decades of teaching, his students still were his teachers. This speaks to the space he created as a professor, one in which every student was encouraged to bring their full selves, their diverse stories, their unique talents, and all of this was valid knowledge in his classroom. Now in my own classes, it's my goal to create a similar space in which everyone feels truly welcome and truly seen and truly heard, and while I'm continuously learning how to do this well, I know it's possible because I saw it with him. Indeed, anyone who sat with Professor, and which you all know, felt that sense of being deeply seen and heard and honored to the core. Those of us who had the opportunity to work in his office saw the steady stream of people wanting to talk with him, ambassadors, journalists, students from several decades past now doing incredible things in the world. Yet whether they were an ambassador or a freshman who just arrived to campus or a custodian who has worked at the university for years, he would invite them in to sit, offer them a Werther's Originals, look into their eyes as they spoke, and treat everyone with the same dignity and respect, recognizing their full humanity. In his classes, we would talk about how all humans are equal in dignity and rights, about how all creation is sacred. But in being with Professor Said, I, I got to really understand what that means in practice, what it really means for peace to begin with each of us in our everyday lives. It is perhaps one of the greatest, most profound and transformative gifts we can offer someone to be fully present with them and have them feel truly seen and heard and honored. And I got to see how he offered that gift every day over the years with everyone. But as I know so many here can relate, Professor Said was so much more to me than, than this particular role of being my university professor. He was a spiritual guide and mentor. When I was going through a difficult personal experience in which I almost left the, the program, the PhD program, Professor was there for me offering guidance and support offering meditations and poems and prayers, calling to see how my heart is doing today. When my husband and I first met, Professor offered so much support and gentle guidance for both of us on our love and spiritual journeys. And so a year after I graduated and after Professor had retired, my husband and I asked him if he'd be willing to officiate our wedding. And of course he said yes. Here, I have to say that one of the beautiful blessings of working for him was actually getting to witness and learn the love that he shared with his beautiful wife, Elena. The conversations we had with both of them leading up to our wedding were so instrumental in helping us live out our own love and values. And having them with us on that special day was the ultimate blessing of our marriage. 
At our wedding, Professor urged us to, and with great passion he said, get caught in a love triangle, to think love, to talk love, and to do love. Let love, lover, and beloved become one. Like so much of the wisdom he has shared with all of us, I know the true meaning of the statement will continue to unfold for my husband and I in the years to come, deepening its impact. I know if we were to spend our lifetime seeking to live out his words in this one statement, it is a life very well lived. I feel peace in knowing that Professor's light continues to shine through each of us and his eternal wisdom will continue to unfold and delight us for years to come. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Chuck Call. Um, I'm a professor at the School of International Service and uh, currently the chair of the International Peace and Conflict Resolution Program that Professor Said founded. Um, and it's such a lovely occasion, a sad occasion, but a joyful occasion for me to be here and a real honor because the kinds of people that Abdulaziz attracted are the kind of people that I want to be and I want to be like. And so thank you. Um, I first met Abdulaziz when I came for a job interview in 2004. I didn't really know what to expect, but I was so taken by him. Of course, we had lunch at De Carlo's. Um, so, uh, and, uh, and I was tutored in the ways of De Carlo's. And uh, but it was, uh, I, I learned even from that interview, which I, I will not forget, and that is his um, ability to, to listen, to ask, and to get to know one in a way that I still use when I meet with students and the, the first year students in the program are still coming in to office hours. And of course, my first question is, is tell me about yourself and where are you from? Where did you grow up? And, um, and, and that really comes from my, uh, from Aziz really uh, influenced my, my approach to interacting with these students in ways that Professor Jafari just described. Um, of course, he listened intently to me and seemed to be seeking what was best for me in this process, not just what was good for the university and for the school and for the hiring process. Um, it's indicative of the role that uh, Abdulaziz played in a low-key but persistent way, teacher, mentor, leader, example. Um, he was all those things for me, but also I feel for all of us faculty members, and I feel like I'm here not speaking for the other faculty members of our program, but um, here on behalf of them. Um, he knew when he could provide advice, and he did, and uh, for all of us, but also when not to. Um, he, he could read people so well. He read me well. Um, made me feel not just welcome, but that I belonged as a faculty member at, at SIS. And in eliciting who I was and how I thought of my own role as a scholar and a teacher, he helped define and helped me define my place in the school and the program and indeed in the field. Um, he also immediately showed he has the back of his colleagues. Um, he would run interference with the deans, no offense, Dean Chen, um, <laughs> over teaching assignments or service assignments after frank consultation with us. Um, and, and so it, it, something that also has been an example for all of us. His ability to focus his intense gaze on a person and hear them and listen to them and make them feel heard from students and extended every, every time you observe him, he's doing this right. And, and this extends from students to staff to the custodians uh, of the building. Um, and he linked that personal with the institutional and other levels that influence people around him and the world as well. Most of you are familiar with the touchstone legacies that he's, he's left behind. The creation of the program, the, the International Peace and Conflict Resolution Program 20 years ago, the creation of a real sense of community among students and staff and faculty, the linking of key peace advocate NGOs, uh, whom you'll hear from right after me, and uh, one example of those, and their, and their leaders with our faculty and our students, uh, the integration of the spiritual and the personal with the institutional and the global. I mean, this is something that was really um, quite striking and a real contribution. His definition of what the Muhammad Farsi chair of Islamic peace would be and what it would do, all of those legacies um, 
uh, you're, you're familiar with, um, I think. He showed his vision and leadership in his scholarship as well, addressing themes of global peace and knowledge from marginalized voices in the global south well before it became fashionable. Um, of course, he was also a leader when it came to setting the tone of the school and the university. His moral clarity came through in his dignified interventions in, in, in community and uh, faculty meetings and his welcoming new students and giving them that individualized treatment where he made them feel heard. His leadership was often less visible, but he wasn't afraid for it to be visible. Um, and the story of, he tells of how SIS students organized themselves to crash an SIS faculty meeting to demand the creation of this master's program in peace and conflict resolution is one that he, he enjoys telling and that we tell every year to our incoming students. Um, but his own hand in supporting that and supporting those students, he, he doesn't, let's just say he minimized that role and he tells the story, right? Um, he knew how to empower students and of course sought to empower those who came from underprivileged backgrounds as well. This is especially true in his ability to create community among international students, um, but also among students of color, poor students, first gen students, and those who were feeling like misfits for whatever reason. Um, it is remarkable how many tales we have of, of people who are now faculty or students or former students who say, I was on the cusp of dropping out and I went and spoke to Professor Said and, and he found a way to support me through. Um, I'm going to close with a story that Aziz told every year in addressing the incoming students in orientation. He drew on a parable reportedly dating from the 1670s when architect Christopher Wren was rebuilding St. Paul's Cathedral in London after it had burned. Uh, Wren allegedly encountered three stonecutters working and asked the first what he was doing and why. That man replied that he had to feed his family and was working in order to do so. He asked a second stonecutter the same question, who replied that he was building a wall. He was really good at it. And the third man he asked raised his eyes to the sky and said, I'm building a cathedral. And Aziz would then say to the students, this is what we were doing here at SIS. We were building cathedrals. And this parable, I think, captures what his life, Aziz's life, was all about, building cathedrals that are each of us, his friends, his students, his loved ones, his colleagues, and even strangers. Uh, he sought to help us build our own visions uh, and created a context that linked our lives to that larger vision. So, thank you. My name is Mubarak Awad. <clears throat> I'm a Palestinian from Jerusalem. Our celebration today with the theme, Blessed the Peacemaker. Abdul Aziz was blessed in his life to be a peacemaker. I met Aziz in 1985 at Roost, Austria, as part of an international delegation to make peace between the United States and Central America through a process initiated by psychologist Carl Roger. We were the only two Arabs, so it was a natural friendship that participant thought we know each other for years. After our first meeting, I asked Aziz to come to the Palestinian Center for the Study of Nonviolence in Jerusalem. We organized a nonviolence conference with the Jordanian Palace for peacemakers. Abdul Aziz asked to speak on making peace with your enemy. 
it was a challenging subject as Palestinians are under military, harsh Israeli occupation, and we have hot, healthy discussion after that. He wasn't hesitate to make peace with enemies. In 1988, I was imprisoned by the Israelis government and they deported me. <clears throat> Even I was supported by the US administration and especially with George Shultz was sent to Israel with the hope that the Israeli will change their mind from my deportation. But all efforts failed. I came to Washington, D.C., and Abdul Aziz and Elena welcomed me and Nancy, my wife, in their home until we find a suitable place to live. Thank you. Aziz then asked me if I can teach nonviolence theory and methods at the American University. He helped me in starting also the organization of Nonviolence International and was a board member. We, be we became traveling and meeting with organization working for peace around the world. We organized a small group to meet with Yasser Arafat in Tunis, so we can give him and the leaders of the PLO an alternative methods to the armed struggle. It was tense and excited meeting for more than three days of serious discussions that I believe we made a change in the thinking of the PLO. Abdelaziz and I discussed Syria many times and we have many programs regarding Syria. One of his ideas is how to bridge the Syrian government with the American government so that they will start understanding each other. So we discussed that and one of the problems was how to work with the Syrian government and to tell them that they have to let the Jews out of Syria, to leave Syria and to come to Syria as Syrian citizens do, and not to make that difference. And that was one of the achievement that we were able to do in Syria. Then, we have 30 Syrian top officials. We brought them to United States and we have people from the Senate, from the White House, from the State Department to discuss ways that Syria and the United States would work together. Aziz and I were invited to Syria by President Assad to speak at two universities in Aleppo and in Damascus and give a lecture for Syrian diplomats. After the first speech on human rights and peacemaking, we received a message from the Syrian authorities and were gently asked to leave the country and our next lectures are canceled. <laughs> to be a peacemaker, have good and bad moments. <laughs> At the American University, a new summer program for teaching peacemaking was designed by Abdelaziz Said and Adrian Kaufman 
and Muhammad Abu Nimr, hundreds of teachers and scholars from around the world came and experienced the strength and possibility of individual to make peace as well as collective effort with great results. Visiting different countries around the world with Abdul Aziz was fun. He loved to visit his students and many of those started small organizations in their countries to promote peace. Traveling with Aziz Meeting presidents and political leaders from, for him was nothing new. He treated everyone as equal with the same message for peace. One of the things I, I hardly forget, I was one time in his office, a young student came and she was crying and tired and she was want to quit. And he told her, I am a child from North Syria, from the desert, and I made it. You could made it too. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Christine Chin, and I serve as the Dean of the School of International Service at American University. With me are some of my colleagues from SIS, as well as the President of AU, Sylvia Matthews Bova. I'm quite sure that several of you in this room have heard Professor Said say at one time or another that he was, quote, a contributor to a university built on sacred ground. Now, AU was his home indeed, and he, and he owned it proudly. But why sacred? Over the decades, he insisted to colleagues, and particularly to president after president, that AU should not keep chasing after someone else's dream, but that we have and continue to dream our own dream. That when we dare to know who we are, we are fearless in successfully charting our own distinctive path for the greater good. And AU is the place and space where fates intersect and lives are transformed. For the longest time, Professor Said knew what many didn't or couldn't fully appreciate. AU's law school was founded at the turn of the century in order to admit women when other law schools refused. AU established what we now know today as a school of public affairs immediately after the New Deal in order to literally train and staff and overnight expansion of the public sector. And not long after the Cold War started in the 1950s, Professor Said bore witness to and served as one of the first faculty members for AU's new School of International Affairs. The founders intentionally named it the School of International Service with the core mission of, quote, being dedicated to the service of humanity. SIS faculty and students were charged with waging peace in the middle of the Cold War. He understood SIS AU to be the sacred ground from which future leaders would be nurtured to serve humanity by waging peace in all of its forms. How bold and visionary we were. Professor Said knew he had chosen the right place, or he would humbly say, the place chose him. He graciously returned the gesture a thousandfold over and with unconditional love for the next 60 years of his career and life. For example, you've heard the establishment of the Phi Epsilon Pi chapter at American University. When the discipline of international relations refused to consider contributions from other disciplines, he led the fight in SIS to hire and support scholars from disciplines such as anthropology, geography, communication, psychology. When the discipline rejected and trenchantly resisted educating students to explore alternative causes of conflict and paths to peace, you've heard, 
He founded the Center for Global Peace in SIS, and then worked with his students to create the country's first graduate program called International Peace and Conflict Resolution. He served as its founding director, and it quickly became one of the largest programs of its kind in the world. Decades ago, he was one of the first scholars to make the case then for inclusion of non-Western and alternative perspectives in the theory and practice of IR. He went on to produce over 100 publications in addition to 25 scholarly books. You've heard policymakers and thought leaders called on him for his expertise on a range of issues. Professor Said modeled conduct way before it became imperative for university campuses to confront the lack of equity, diversity, and inclusion. He was a scholar teacher who refused to close his door. He kept his eyes, ears, heart, and mind open to students, colleagues, and employees, domestic and international, regardless of their rank, background, or station in life. He fought for their rights. He fought for their dignity. He mentored, as we've heard, with wisdom, patience, love, and understanding, generations of students who went on to serve their communities, paid it forward, and gave back, whether or not they held highly visible positions of power and influence. How bold and visionary he was. Peace can only come about with critical inquiry, understanding, collaboration, equity, social justice that are firmly anchored in love, the unity, and oneness of self-other. Years before he officially retired from SIS, there already existed three separate scholarships specifically named after him. And at his encouragement, some key generalist, generously funded initiatives supporting and highlighting our school's mission. And you've heard from Hani, he was the first chair, he was the first holder of the Mohammed S. Farsi chair. To this day, no other faculty member comes close to having this kind, this depth and breadth of impact. I hope wherever his spirit may be today, that he's proud of his alma mater, his home built on sacred ground. AU has recently established an independent school of education to train teachers for the 21st century. And he'd also be proud of how AU, led by the president and her council, navigated the pandemic today. We refused to fire faculty and staff when others did so by the scores and hundreds. We paid for the health insurance of our contract workers. We reduced tuition. We established emergency housing for at-risk students, even when we didn't have the money to do so. So the president, her VPs, the deans, all took a range of pay cuts. The community took pay cuts in order to keep us intact. Despite and because of the pandemic, AU is undeterred in its pursuit of our inclusive excellence plan. As difficult and as challenging it is to do today, in today's climate, it is being done, office by office, level by level, school by school across the entire campus. In SIS, his primary home within a home, we took AU to the top in the country for Bourne Fellowships this year. Students are in all regions of the world conducting research in the name of waging peace. SIS is taking interdisciplinary research, training, learning, teaching to the next level. And we continue to review and revamp our curricula to ensure that we reach inclusion of marginalized and non-Western perspective worldviews and contributions. And I'm proud to announce that in fall 2022, SIS will roll out the undergraduate sophomore level Abdul Aziz Said Peace Scholars Program. <laughs> Peace Scholars Program complete with co-curricular activities that affirm the connection between idea, action, and service, firmly linking the head and heart for this upcoming generation of peacemakers and change makers. His, my, our mater, our alma mater, is no longer chasing after someone else's dream or trying to walk someone else's path. We lead unapologetically for the greater good in the service of humanity. And he, Abdulaziz Saeed, the young child who experienced the horrors of French-occupied Syria, but who as an adult found a home in 
and made indelible contributions to a university built on sacred ground in Washington, DC. The scholar, teacher, mentor, friend will always be this giant on whose shoulders we stand. And in conclusion, I, as an SIS alumna, as one of his former mentees, and as dean, am pleased to announce that American University commits to the effort to establish an endowed chair in the name of Abdul Aziz Saeed. <laughs> After all, we are his living legacy. Thank you. This is a very hard act to follow. <laughs> I am May Rihani, a friend of Abdelaziz. I have known Abdelaziz since 1978. We immediately became good friends. When I met him and after we talked, I knew right away he inspired the people around him. The more we got to know each other, the more I realized how he motivated individuals to actualize the best part of themselves, their higher part, if you will. I saw him interact with his students his friends, with his beloved Elena, and members of his family, with political activists, with political leaders, with researchers, writers, poets, and influencers. And somehow, in his presence, they all gained confidence to do what was right. Hablaziz recognized that the apparent divides between religion, race, culture, political philosophies are man-made and limited. His faith allowed him to recognize that these so-called divides are not rooted in truth and therefore could not facilitate the realization of our deep and undeniable unity and the advancement of humanity. To meet and overcome these obstacles, Ablaziz developed a way of speaking that was built on practical as well as maybe esoteric values, and most importantly, on his vision. The way I understood it is as follows. People from different backgrounds, cultures, and religions need to engage with each other and truly, actively listen. To listen, it means to begin to know the other. We have to still our judgment to understand and accept their point of view, and that would be the first step. This way, <clears throat> we could learn about each other. As a result, we jointly discover the common ground, the richness of one another, rather than the perceived limitations. Aziz, knew that even among those who even historically did not see eye to eye, building walls never helps. However, building bridges is the beginning of resolving disagreements and conflicts. He wanted to stretch the minds 
and in particular, the hearts of his students. He wanted his friends to get involved in peace movements. He wanted scholars and act activists to dig deep and find the common ground among those who believe they will never reach agreement. He wanted us all to recognize that we are all connected through the oneness of humanity. He inspired all those who, learn, who heard him or read his writings. His voice became the voice of advocating for equality, justice, and global peace. What he said, what he taught, and what he wrote had the impact of inspiring and transforming his students, colleagues, friends, political activists around him, transforming them all towards following a path that leads to social justice and peace. Peace everywhere in our very fragile earth. Every time I heard him, every time I read him, he inspired me to do more along the pathway of peace. Aziz became a light that illuminates our minds and expands our hearts. My dear friend, Abdul Aziz, we have gathered today to celebrate your vision and your light. You are blessed. Good afternoon. I am Bassam Saeed Ishaq number 11 of a family of 12. Fortunately for me, within this large family was Aziz, a brother, an older brother. One of the most caring and loving individual I have ever known. He was also a man of great faith and inner strength. After our father died. I came to view Aziz not only as a brother, but a second father to me. You see, my father fathered him when he was 30 years old. He fathered me when he was 60 years old. <laughs> so he was both an older brother and also a second father. Many of you may know that our father was a notable politician, politician in Syria. And as a nationalist leader against French occupation, and later as a member of parliament for nearly 24 years. What you might not know about my brother is despite our father's prominence for much of his childhood, as he's lived in a mud house, with no electricity, no water. His village, our village, Amuda, uh, was burned to the ground during the French occupation. Escaping to a large city only me meant meeting bigger bombs and further dislocation. Our father was sent into exile and Aziz lost his mother. This all occurred before he was 10 years old. I'm sharing these details because it magnifies how far my brother went in life. Despite so much trauma, it also explains his commitment to peace. One of the many gifts he passed on to me. The political situation in Syria meant 
that I did not meet Aziz until mid-1960s. However, I knew I had a big brother in America who was a very important professor and traveled the world. So at age seven, when I finally met him, uh, uh, near mythical sibling, I was thrilled. We were in Beirut to hear Aziz lecture at AUB. I felt proud watching all the people clap. It was a very exciting event. However, there was an incident uh, that was slightly, slightly marred, that slightly marred things. I began walking into the street. I was trying to cross the street of my own in Beirut and Al Hamra, and uh, and I did it. I crossed, but Saeed, uh, but Aziz really freaked out, and uh, he grabbed me. Uh, uh, excuse me. And uh, so he grabbed me and, and, and forcefully rebuked me for crossing the street on my own. So when I was back in Syria and I was asked, uh, uh, I asked my parents, you know, what, what was that reaction about? That was when I learned that we had a brother named Riyad, who at age three was killed by French military truck because he had walked into the street on his own. Aziz then, he, who, when he was 10 years old, carried our brother home, tasting the blood in his mouth as he ran. Our brother died in his arms. Aziz told me this incident was one of the first to open his eyes to the horrors of violent conflict. The true beginning of Aziz and my, <coughs> and my strong and everlasting relationship, it was in the mid-1970s. I was no longer a small boy, but almost an adult. Aziz came to Syria in 1975. He was mobbed by local leaders, uh, all wanting to spend time with him. Uh, he was also working for the State Department project. Yet despite his schedule, Aziz made time for us to talk one-on-one -on -one about my future. This was uh, this is just one of so many examples of Aziz's generosity and spirit. He was never one to push, rather he listened carefully, asked questions that helped me come to my own decisions. After several conversations, it was clear I, was, uh, I would go to America. In the US, I felt like a fish out of water. Uh, once again, despite all of his commitments, Aziz made time for me weekly to discuss my academic progress and provided gentle guidance. He gave me a sense of comfort and stability as I navigated my way. I became an engineer, however, in my heart, I knew this was not for me and later questioned if America was for me. And indeed, I returned uh, uh, to Syria. I think Aziz knew this intuitively. Uh, we spent a lot of time together. Uh, I decided with his encouragement to move back to Syria and uh, to shift eventually to political activism. Uh, when Aziz first saw me back in Syria, I'll never forget this. We sat down to have a cup of coffee. Uh, uh, he looked at me and he said, you look like a flower back in its own soil. I'll never forget this. Living in Syria and having many conversations with Aziz, I realized 
the only road to peace was, as Aziz always said, a recognition of the human rights of all in a pluralistic society. And this was actually the project I ended up doing to this day and that I am involved in. With Aziz's help, I got a master's in, in ethno-political conflict management in Canada. My brother gave me the moral courage to become active in a non-violent opposition. I had to go through many challenges in Syria, as you can imagine. Uh, the only benefit to political, uh, I had to go through many challenges in Syria. The only benefit, and eventually I ended up in a political up, ex, sort of exile here, back in the state three years ago. And the only benefit of this political exile, exile was the time I was able to spend with Aziz. That was especially after his retirement. Uh, we had times to talk about everything, ranging from religious, religion, his days in Syria, our late father, what uh, his legacy meant to Aziz, to me. Of course, we talked about politics, and these were precious moments that I will cherish forever. Aziz, through his constant love and kindness, kind guidance, helped me shape my destiny. He helped me to be what I was supposed to become. I work now for a pluralistic, in a, for a pluralistic model in Syria. And I never imagined that something like this will ever happen anywhere in Syria or anywhere in the Middle East. So the legacy uh, moves on. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Riyad Saeed. Yes, yes, yes. I want to first thank Elena for bringing us all together today. It's just so wonderful to see all of you here. And it's really heartwarming and comforting to have you here to express your love for my father and to celebrate his life. And I realize now that going last was, was probably not a great idea because after hearing all of your comments, it's, it's, first it's very heartwarming and you've done such a great job expressing all that's special unique about my father and how much and how profound of an impact he's had on all of our lives. I love my father dearly, and I have so many fond memories of all of our time together. I was initially planning to, to give more expansive comments today, to share several stories and experiences, and I realized that it may be overwhelming to do so and to fully express my, my feelings. I do want to say, Paul, I would not change a single one of those five words that you said. I think you just did such a wonderful job of expressing uh, all that's special and unique about my father. And I can certainly say that he was unique in many ways and unlike any other father that I knew when I was growing up. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll try to share a few, a few memories and thoughts. And as you know, my father had a tremendous sense of humor and shared many funny stories. So a few stories that, that I wanted to share is this first is a story that he told me about growing up in Syria and the first time he went to a movie with his brother Fag. So they went to the movie, the MGM lion roared, and they ran out of the theater to get away from the lion because they thought the lion was going to catch them. <laughs> Later on, they came back in, and a train was coming towards them on the screen, so they ducked under their seats so they'd avoid getting run over by the train. <laughs> I think it took them a little while after that before they went back to, to, to the movies. Another story he told me was about his early days in Washington, D.C., when he was still honing his English. And he saw a street sign at an intersection that said, Presbyterians cross here. And wondered, why is there a special place for Presbyterians to cross the street? I could go on and on about a number of stories that my father shared. And again, always, as you know, a very self-deprecating sense of humor that, that was just a great way of expressing his thoughts and views. 
As a youngster, I enjoyed the many times we spent together, going to Great Falls, going to the zoo, the circus, visiting different neighborhoods in, in D.C., and also, as you can imagine, the late 60s, a lot going on in the world. D.C. was certainly central to a lot of that, and just getting exposed, having me, bring me to different areas, being part of what was happening uh, from, from a political standpoint. Also, I remember our times going to movies, uh, which I always enjoyed, and I'll have to admit, some of the movies he took me to were probably mature beyond my years, but I never told my mother about any of those <laughs> movies that we went to. I enjoyed our various, various trips, visiting New York on, on numerous occasions, including going to the UN and ordering a hamburger at 21 Club. Very memorable. Enjoyed our visits to Syria, Lebanon, Morocco, Greece and Egypt and Bassam. Yes, I remember so fondly uh, accompanying my father going to Syria in 1975, actually sleeping in the, in the mud house that, that my father grew up in under the stars and meeting my, my, my family. And it was just such a wonderful, incredible experience for me to do that. The other thing that, that always struck me about all of our trips is anywhere we went in the world, my father had friends, former students, colleagues. So anywhere we were greeted by people that he knew and had spent time with and had an impact on, which always, uh, well, I'll never forget. So these trips were always fun, educational, memorable, and they certainly had an impact on shaping my worldview. My father was always encouraging, always positive, always interested in subjects and ideas that were important to me, even though I knew at some point probably if it wasn't for my interest, he wouldn't have expressed so much interest. But as you know, that's the way he was. Compassionate, open, kind, uh, and always inviting me to, to share my thoughts and views. He was always supportive, and he was a great listener. He wasn't judgmental, except for maybe the rare occasion as a teenager they did something stupid. <laughs> he had a unique way of perceiving the world, perceiving situations, and responding to questions and ideas, and he always offered unique insight and perspective that really expanded my view uh, of the world. My father exposed me to a variety of, of cultures, philosophies, spiritual ideas, and certainly expanded my horizon in, in, in many ways, and in ways that I never really fully recognized until later on that he had that impact. I did, I did leave out one part, actually, that I wanted to speak about. Uh, I also have fond memories of spending time with my father at AU and getting to know many of his students, teaching assistants, and colleagues. Many of you are here today, and certainly brings back a flood of memories for me. And what I thought is always, and told my dad, what an incredible group of diverse, bright, talented, unique individuals that you constantly attract to you, which I know is represented by all of you here today. My father was a great mentor, friend, and spiritual guide. And I always felt his love and due strength from him. I know that many of you have all had similar experiences. Dad, I love you, and I hold you in my heart always. Peace be with you. Thank you. Riyadh, thank you. I love you so much. <clears throat> I'd uh, first like to acknowledge and thank our amazing speakers and their beautiful tributes to Aziz. I'm so grateful to all of you because you shared, all of you shared such a unique and beautiful parts of him. So thank you so much. Sorry. Um, I'd also like to thank Angela McLean in the pink mask, my former colleague for 25 years, I think, and dear friend who worked night and day to make this celebration possible. I'd like to thank each and every one of you who's here today. 
to thank you for the love and support that you gave to Aziz for many years. Aziz, my husband, my greatest gift, and my eternal soulmate. I'd like to leave you finally with a very short quote from Aziz that's on the back of your program, which will get you to look at him doing his favorite thing, which is lying in the sun. When peace emanates from you, peace returns to you. Peace be with all of you. I'm so grateful and especially grateful for all of my family who came from so far away to be here. I love all of you so much. Thank you, and I hope you'll join us now in the reception. Thank you.